Hi everyone and welcome to In The Metal. In The Metal is the only show that takes you behind the scenes in the world of independent watchmaking and what an incredible world that is. Uh, it's kind of like a fantasy world hiding in plain sight uh, where some of the most incredible uh, watchmakers work on their own to create their own brands and do their own uh, Work, working for, for some of the bigger brands and uh, creating absolutely amazing pieces. So every week we talk to one of the uh, a, a, a personality in the watch industry, in the independent sector, the people who are the creators, the innovators, the inventors, these artists who commit their lives to creating these astonishing time pieces and the most uh, most likely museum pieces of the future. Uh, every, every week uh, I am in, uh, joined from across the Atlantic Ocean by a guy who is a true heavy metal rock and roll legend who has become, uh, taken on a new life as a master of complications, master watchmaker, specializing in haute horlogerie and a champion for independent watchmaking in the United States of America, where there is a lot of work to be done to establish a new presence there for this extraordinary worldwide industry. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to shoot across the Atlantic Ocean up to North Carolina and to see if Mr. Dan Spitz, the former lead guitarist with Anthrax no less, 30 million album sales, three Grammy nominations, and now leading the charge for the independent watch sector in the United States. Mr. Dallas Fitz, are you there? Yes, sir. Hey, How hey. you doing, everybody? The master of gelato. That's what I am. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah. That's about it. All that other stuff is a bunch of crap. Well, absolutely, man. You know, all these words are there again. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, yeah. Johnny. And of course, I, I never read a word of it, like, you know, so it's leave, next week, it'll be leave, something else. Leave it to a writer to write cool stuff like that. <laughs> You're a good so man. Well. You're a good man. You're representing your country. I'm representing my country. And today, uh, we have somebody representing. Uh, a kick-ass country as far as I'm concerned. You know, all, all the people that we interview, uh, it's global. You know, we want to show the independent watchmaking comes from all over the world. You know, the people that have, uh, you know, stomped through uh, those Swiss desert lands and made it out the other side to rep come back home and represent who they are. The work uh, that they do represents who they are through those trenches and years of study, going back to a company perhaps and working there after school and finding and creating their identity. Their identity is then pronounced to the rest of us through their art. Um, and their art is my art. My past art was music. Um, and now of course, timepieces. Um, the next guest that we have this week is, is just, you know, he really does know doesn't need an introduction. I kind of I wrote that earlier. It's kind of cheesy, but you know. <laughs> but it, it really it is true in independent watchmaking. He he really changed so much for so many. He broke so many barriers um, that were that were just innovative. And um, you know, it's those kind of people like Peter, who's going to be on here in a second. Um, people like Peter are not recognized till many years later. When you look back and go and you start reading about them and go really that dude did that are you serious i didn't know that i thought it was the other guy and it isn't it's the guy behind the scenes who's the guy who makes it happen and peter's that guy and he and he's just he just kicks ass so and he, he is one of the most uh he, he, he's one of the, the, the true gentlemen of this industry he has worked with so many different people he has worked on so many different pieces, including historic restorations of classical time pieces. And he has, what he has done in most recent times, he has almost in a philanthropic way, he has 
and, and typical of the man, I may add, he is giving again more than he has ever taken out of this industry. And uh, he is, we know him as Mr. Peter Speak Marin. People would know him as Peter Speak Marin or the Naked Watchmaker. And we would love to welcome you, Peter, this evening. How are you? Can you hear us okay? Um, I can hear you perfectly. I can see you, and uh, you look both dashing and wonderful. That's right. Um, <laughs> both be described as being kick-ass and a gentleman in the same line. It's <laughs> amazing. Thank you. You've made my entire day. I appreciate. It. <laughs> let me clean the no, let me clean the stuff off my nose first, man. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Look, it, it is really true. I really look up to people who represent their country. Obviously, I'm trying to do that here in a completely new light, and it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, it was quite difficult when I started my this journey way back when to get my little, you know, the official papers to be watch, a watchmaker and then a complication specialist and then get into Switzerland before all the Internet. But I'm from the United States of America where they look at us like, you're what? You fix what? Something with a battery? You know, watchmakers, mm -hmm. United States, you know, you... When, you know, when did you that kind of, when did you uh, I started in, uh, well, I started when I was eight years old, but to get my, my, my grandfather is a, was a watchmaker and jeweler in the Catskill Mountains of New York. So I'm third generation, actually. But to get my papers was the day I walked off and retired from music was in 95. Wow. Yeah. You happy to have made the choice? Oh, absolutely. It was, I was, was dreaming about it for years and years, you know, laying on a tour bus, reading books, reading every book I could get, you know, going on stage that night, couldn't wait to get off stage to go on my bunk to read books about watchmaking, which, you know, I, it was in my blood my, 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 my whole life, like I said, because I was around it since I was a little child, taking apart Patek Philippe's when I was eight years old, my grandfather had me on his lap. But to get those papers we needed back then and to get that goal to get to Wostep in Switzerland for an American, was it, it you couldn't it was it didn't no one's ever did it before you know and then and then to repair uh, complications over in switzerland that was difficult so but f enough about me what i'm saying is i'm gonna throw it right back in your face because you're representing your country you know and and you're doing it now and in just a really a really killer and unique and groundbreaking way you know it's something i've never seen none of us have ever seen anything what you're doing now but we'll we'll get to that but a little bit about me but we'll, if I flip that on you and say you quit school at 17 years old, so you were dreaming way early and you left school and you had the same kind of bug in you. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that little journey when you were 17 years old, what you were dreaming about and where that little journey took you. I left, I left, uh, I left school and I was halfway through my A-levels studying physics, chemistry, um, and I think economics. And I discovered halfway through that I was pretty much incapable of adding up, which in those subjects wasn't very useful. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't actually have a direction. My dad was a bus driver. My mom was a clerk, and it was only literally 25 years later that I actually found out that I did have watchmaking uh, DNA blood, um, which dated back to the middle of the 19th century. But wow. it was never a motivation, and I never knew about it until much later on. So I basically left school, had no direction, tried to get into engineering, tried to get into the RAF in the mechanical side, and to cut a very long story short, I was introduced to Hackney Technical College in London, Technical College um, where they had a, a time, I think it was two years in one term, um, course in uh, general horology. Um, and the quiz teacher that introduced me to it gave it to me with a sense of incredible relief that there was something that would actually appeal to me. And I went in and the people were there was an oddball group, and I was always an, an oddball individual, so they, it kind of fitted, ranging from my age of 17 to guys who had retired, who were in their late 50s and early 60s. One of the guys, a guy called Radbourne, he'd spent most of the last 30 years selling Rolls-Royce cars, and he always wanted to become a clockmaker. So I landed in the school. I enjoyed it. Um, I was pretty reasonable at it without actually having to work my ass off. It kind of worked. 
And I never, in a sense, looked back. It went from there to Wostep. Um, and at Wostep, we were one of the youngest groups ever to have gone to Wostep at the time. This was in 1987. Uh, and I found out later the reason was, was the school basically was running out of uh, funding. And whereas normally you had to have had three years of commercial experience, they took us, a, a very mixed group of young people from around the world, um, to be able to ensure that the school would actually continue. So that was yeah. kind of, you know, this was um, at a time where the industry was really in a very, very bad place. So it was not good for the industry, but it was great for us because we got to, to jump forward. And from Wostep, um, I did a bunch of other things, but it was, it was probably Wostep was the catalyst to something which made, gave me a direction. I knew that this is what I wanted to do, it's what I love doing. And ironically, and I will sh shut up in a second. Um, Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> from, 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 from that point, I I'll let you go, bro, don't worry. Much, <laughs> as much as I love to make, and I always love the creative side of watchmaking, I loved helping the other students. I loved the sharing of knowledge. Mm. Um, and in a sense, although I never did it a first step, I always wanted to be able to, to give what I loved somehow. And that was, there's, there's a continued story of that, which is when I was in restoration in London and I was restoring these collector's pieces from Christie's, Sotheby's, Antiquorum, um, all of the big auction houses, they would send watches to, to Somalo Antiques in Piccadilly. And it was there that I completely fell in love with this business, uh, this art. And I started with an old medium format camera photographing the watches that I was restoring because I knew that I was seeing things that nobody else was ever going to see. Right. And what I was seeing was not just a, a, a watch. It was a piece of art. And it was a reflection of, as you described it earlier, the people or the person who conceived the idea, who made the assembly, who did the finishing, who put the whole thing together. Because what you look at, is actually a person. You look at the part of their life. Uh -huh. and that is what I loved doing then, and that is the catalyst for the Naked Watchmaker today. And that's the catalyst for independent watchmaking as far as I'm concerned, um, and modern day independent watchmaking as well. So you've run a very similar path um, you know, for me to get to Woe Step. And so people understand, Woe Step back when Peter went and I went shortly after, um, was very small. It wasn't a curriculum that was instituted throughout the entire world. Um, Antoine Simonet, who was the co-creator of the curriculum, was probably there when you were there, Peter, of course, um, was my teacher and was probably played a large role in Peter's teachings. Um, um, he's a character. It just, he's, he's a powerhouse of the industry. Um, and again, a trendsetter. And he developed this course that he wanted to implement throughout the United States, throughout the world, excuse me, to, um, uh, we were in those dire straits that Peter talked about where we would um, train watchmakers the correct way, not the Swiss way, the correct way. And when people went and got into that school, it's a very special place, uh, we'll step in Neuchâtel, not just the program instituted somewhere else around the world where you go, that's wonderful as well. But there's something special about sitting in that school and especially when Antoine was there. Um, when you come out of that school, you're you're different. You're you're changed because you see things in that school as well that are that are quite different, and you get sent back to your seat a lot. I don't care who you are that they're <laughs> sending you back to your seat. You suck spits. You can't do this half spring for <laughs> you. Just can't. Then try it again. Come back next week. So it is very difficult, and it pushes us past our limits. Um, very similar to music when you know you're in a studio with a famous producer. And it's not good enough. You got to keep going and, and make that song better, make that riff better. You got to double and triple your same part being a human. And then you find out very swiftly, you, it's very difficult to, to exactly do something a second time, a third time, and a fourth time. So I find that really interesting that after Woe Step, again, you went to work uh, restoring pieces and you saw what was back then really independent watchmaking from the past come across your bench and realize that's art. And 
that just twisted everything. That's the same thing happened to me. Because you'll see the same movement when you're doing restorations. You see some A shields back then or whatever they were, you know, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to fix this. But then when something special hits your bench, you're like, wow, like where did, what planet did this dude come from? And that's independent watchmaking. And you realize there's different people out there and it is art. What we're producing is art. So unquestionably, yeah. Yeah. So if, so from there, you somehow ended up at Renault and Pape. Well, it was a little bit more. And another thing about what you're saying about uh, Wostep, which is like, I don't know, a life lesson, is that with everything that the school would give, it was only equivalent to whatever you were prepared to put into it. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if it was the same as the same process as when you were there. Probably, yeah. The harder you worked, the quicker that you went, the, the better the quality work that you produced, Simone would then give you more work. You yeah. could accelerate through the different stages of the course. And you went from repairing things like the Alfred Shield to to the Rolex, to the Vacheron, to the European watch and clock, to the the marine chronometer. And the better, the more you learned, the more he would feed you. Uh -huh. And I was with a group of guys, none of us had any, any cash. And what cash we had, we would basically save for the weekend to spend on beer. So we spent <laughs> the majority, yeah, grown ups. Yeah. Um, so we spent the most of our time working, and we would work there during the day. We'd work there in the evening. We'd actually uh, turn down the main lights. There's this crappy little radio in the corner where we would probably turn up anthrax as loud as possible. Uh -oh, and then there would be this in the background. <laughs> and everybody was loving it. And every individual person was just lit by their, their lamp over their bench. I mean, right. every person, the, the few of us who actually did that of, of an evening. So the more you actually put into it, the more you got out of it. And you it know, was an incredible time. It was exactly the same um, when I was there. Uh, and, and for me, what I'm finding out now as I talk to other people that have gone through school later and somewhat um, is it was all Antoine. You know, we, we both know a lot about him. I'm sure I'm, you know, I, I became very close with him. He used to take me on little tool runs with me and him, these secret little garages and stuff where I thought I was going to be killed. Um, but it was the same. He gave us all a, a key 24 hours a day uh, access. Mm -hmm. And it was may, maybe a little different. He, the way he explained it to me was Spitz. He goes, whoever's the fastest, you better catch him. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to push him forward. I don't care how long you got to be here, bro. I know your background. I know you've been doing this a long time. You need to kick, you know, kick ass on whoever's number one. So that's really what it was. You got to chase who, if, if someone was there and they did grow up in their grandfather's store and they had proper training in hair springs. And when the hair spring part of the course came, let's say we were doing overcoils or brigade overcoils for those who don't know if that guy whipped it up in, in 45 minutes and it took you a week, you needed to stay a long time to catch up. So I, I'm assuming it's the same kind of thing when you were there so just so everyone understands mm -hmm. that that's why i'm trying to explain to everyone if you can you know get into uh um or get away from your life somehow and get to do your uh, training in wostep or now um 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 on rig school uh um what's it uh kw khwcc that's another killer modern school yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you did a, you did yeah. something on the yeah. naked watchmaker with, with Henri. um you know, he's another woe step uh, a teacher, actually. So he's basically like, a, yep. it's basically woe step. Let's let's be honest. You know, it's a it's a big ass school. It's a it's a different learning experience. You know, you're removed from the world, and 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 like Peter said, you you it's uh you're not going to get that anywhere else. It really drives you. And and look at Peter. He remembers all this stuff now. You know, years and years later, it's it's part <laughs> of him. Good or bad. Yes. <laughs> it 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 but, uh, no, no, it was, it was the other big thing is that I was set working. We were kids. It was like 17, 18 years old, uh, living in Switzerland, uh, away from home. And actually, we were living in the Maison de Jeune, which was actually a youth hostel, recently restored, beautiful, for wayward children. So really? it was kind of, yeah, it was a really weird thing. So we were all of the same age group, but... 
we connect with connected with all of these other Swiss and and, and mostly Swiss um, uh, youths of our own age group, all who had their own luggage with them, and there was it was wonderful. It was the most incredible period. Yeah, he wouldn't. Uh, let, they wouldn't let me stay where I wanted either. It, part of it back then was you were supposed to have the Swiss experience. So I stayed uh, in Neuchâtel, the top of the hill by the train station, in a in a lady's house in a home um, where she had a few. She had a few of us in there actually. Same same kind of thing, like a like a hostel kind of thing. Uh, she worked at Rolex doing hair springs. As funny mm -hmm. as that may sound, for like twenty years. So it was it was a good yeah. place. But there was nuns coming in and out, and it was it was pretty trippy. <laughs> oh. They were real nuns, lovely. So it looked okay. like you paved the way for me if you were blasting anthrax there, those walls were calling my name. Once again, we find another watchmaker who's a metalhead too, and I didn't even ask, so. Yeah, no. it seems to me. I always, you know, because people have this preconceived notion, Peter, that like, we're sitting on the top of the Le Brasso Mountain by Audemars Piguet in a, sh in a wood shed with another old dude who can barely walk, you know, he's got a cane. He's like, hey, okay, take a part, this to me on today. And that's the perception they have. And then they come to find out, you know, we're blasting metal, we're blasting, you know, cool stuff while we're taking apart masterpieces. So it must boggle some people's minds, but it's what makes us calm, you know? Somebody else might be blasting Barbara Streisand, that's fine with them. And we do find that, you know. <laughs> I mean, no. I, might, I might blast that on a really? Thursday or something. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. More for you, Johnny. Definitely, I can see Barbara Streisand. Star Wars. <laughs> I have, I have a good tattoo right here. <laughs> so, so but, Peter, uh, we all we all know your past, man. We all we all know the masterpieces that you created because they've infiltrated all of us. Anyone that's an independent, anyone that's a collector. Uh, there's a lot of collectors that that are, are following um, this series here. Um, they know exactly who you are. They they know the the mind print that you've made on their minds with your mechanics, and your it's it's quite astonishing. And you you were out of the box way early in the gate. You know, like like when I did with my music, I was out of the box. We think a little differently than everybody else. So it's just so long you're going to last at somebody else's bench and somebody else's business. It's just so long you're going to be there. You could be a helper, but you really need to be on your own. No matter what you're doing, I don't care if you're selling a bag of rice or what it is on the corner, you're just not made for sitting at somebody else's bench and listening to somebody else. And once again, you've reinvented yourself um, with the Naked Watchmaker. And if you all Google that, just make sure you put up whatever block you got to put on there because you're going to get all kinds of other stuff in your Google there. And I love that name. Uh, it's something actually I probably would have done. That would have been a name that something I would have chose for something for myself because, you know, I just don't care. Uh, but you really made already a swift impact in a short amount of time and an incredible amount of knowledge. If you haven't checked it out, anyone, go to thenakedwatchmaker.com and, and follow Peter and see what he's doing to help others. And that's what this show is about. And uh, that's yeah. what, my, what I do here, creating my own timepiece now is about. Uh, you know, representing America and hopefully getting another two, three watchmakers here, not to work for me, even though I will slave drive them, but to be able to use my machines at, to make their own masterpieces and get them on their way once they're coming out of, of a traditional school, perhaps in Switzerland or wherever that may be, or apprenticeship thereafter. Um, so Peter's doing his work uh, and hard work that is to pass on knowledge that for me and him, when we started was hidden. Let's be real here. It was secret. It was hidden. Um, it was within the Swiss borders because he had to go there and I had yeah. to go there. We both had to go there to gain that next level of knowledge. And then it was another level. And then like, how was I going to get into the complication rooms in Chopard? I'm an American, you know, luckily they're all metalheads. So they, they let me in. <laughs> but, but you know, it was really difficult for us back then. I really want to press that to everyone that's listening because they think, Today was, it, it, it's the same today as yesterday where we have the internet, we can go on YouTube, we can see inside a watch and all that. Me and Peter didn't have any of that. You know, what came across our bench was what we learned. And wherever we went is what we learned. And there was another master or somebody there who taught us a little something or a little something that might be right, or might be wrong, but that's how we had to learn. So we're here, all of us, to give back. And Peter's giving back in a big way here. And if you okay. go, if you follow him and, and go on a site, you'll see, 
interviews like I'm doing with people, but he deconstructs timepieces that most wouldn't even be able to take apart. So it, fill us in a little on your, your initial vision of what the Naked Watchmaker was to be, um, what it is now, where you're headed, um, are you happy where you're at? Because you are impacting people, Peter, in a big way. I just want you to know that because I have people on here all the time now um, and I tell them how much they've impacted myself as from what they've done and all the people I talk to around me, other independent watchmakers or people in the industry, and they look at me like it with these baffled eyes, like me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here struggling. You know, it may look good, but I'm here struggling. And they really don't realize how many lives they really truly have impacted. And Peter, you have, not just with your past, but what you're doing right now is really impacting people. That knowledge is there forever. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing here, same thing. This goes on a YouTube channel, so it's not about just today. This is on our YouTube channel forever. So we want to make sure this knowledge of that road travel wasn't easy to get where you are, Peter. wasn't easy for me. wasn't even wasn't easy for Johnny. He's one of the top writers that there is in our industry. So these stories help the young and the, the youthful or uh, you know on their pathway. So give us some insight what the Naked Watchmaker is, and don't take your freaking pants off. <laughs> trust, trust you, John. You know trust something you. was coming, right, bro? <laughs> it's, I mean, I was expecting that within the first five, okay? But, um, but a basic boring thing, okay? If I had called the site, um, I don't know, Peter's Watchmaking School or the, the School of Horology, uh, people would probably, for the most part, fall into a, a coma within the first five minutes, or it'll be lost from their their memory. I mean, or they'll glaze over, or you know, develop some sort of mentally debilitating disease. Um, <laughs> so, the I, I came up with a few different ideas, uh, and the Naked Watchmaker just seemed to be perfect. And I ran it by a, a mutual friend who you may know, uh, Ian Scallon. Um, yes. And Ian is Australian in origins. He is the most honest person that you want to meet. Sometimes you really do not want him to give you any kind of opinion because he really will tell you uh, what he thinks. And as a friend, he'll be very honest. So, and he liked it. And it was just like, there's no argument, there's no explanation. I just said, this is you know the concept and this is the name. And he kind of said, yeah, that works. So in a way, Ian gave it his uh, blessing. Um, and then the Naked Watchmaker was born, uh, partly because of the uh, affirmation from from him uh, as well. And it's kind of a, a, I mean, basically, it isn't the Naked Watchmaker, it's the Naked Watchmaker, so to speak. So what I started and what I touched on earlier with the uh, experience in London, where I used to get these incredible timepieces and take them apart, photograph them, but then it was in medium format and everything took days to do and then the stuff was published days weeks to do and then it would be published in the the bhi or the international watch magazine and then it would be lost within a month move on literally 30 years and we can do things today that have never been done before um i can do what i did back then uh when it comes to the practical side because it doesn't even though the photography is not a given, you have to learn how to do it, and you have to have an eye, and it's lighting, and a whole bunch of other things, it's accessible. And I'm not a photographer, I'm a watchmaker. But I have enough knowledge to be able to take the, the watches that I dismantle and actually record them as I do do the deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And that is something that has never been done historically, ever. And it is very much indicative of the time that we are living in today, in the same way as independent watchmakers could not have started to flourish 20 years ago or 25 years ago. They existed. Uh, Gary Pratt existed. Daniels existed. These guys were there, and these guys were yeah, they're, they're, they're gods, they're deities. Mm -hmm. um, but the ability to be able to communicate with people all over the world through the internet to be able to take photographs using digital photography um 
these things completely have actually revolutionized, revolutionized and changed the, the watch world that we're living in today. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. Yeah. But when I began 20, when I began as like a self-employed person, which is now, which was 20, 20 years ago, yeah. Um, the reason that I was able to contact people was that I was able to, uh, I, I played, not played, wrong word. I worked uh, out <clears throat> how to take everything that I was making, every little detail, and be able to record it and then share it through the different forums of which at the time it was really the purists and time zone. Right. Um, and it was instant and that was, everything has changed. Then it was really them. And today there's a hundred in a hundred different languages everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first started uh, doing the photography, I was using my phone with a, a lens, um, just a simple magnifying lens on a phone. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it becomes, there are things that you can do today that have never been done before. So technically, it's achievable. The next thing is that the communication uh, is, is achievable. Then people have a hunger today to understand what it is that they're buying. As important as a brand is, marketing is, having celebrities and influencers holding brands watches uh, whoever whatever size company um, more and more people want to understand what it is they're putting their money into what it is that justifies the price of, of, of a product and also it's just it's just kind of common sense if you're going to put down whether it's 500 bucks or 500 thousand you kind of want to academically know that the thing is actually real somehow intrinsically the value is there and it's not always the case but there's a growing number of people who want that and that is not my motivation for what i do my motivation is because i love what i do but it falls perfectly in line with this period of time now all of that then leads to the the next part which is that in the industry, whether you're an independent or whether you're a big brand, and something that I've learned over the last three years is that actually there's an awful lot of similarities that run through companies. If you're a small independent watchmaker, you kind of have to do the same things as a big company, different levels. You've got to do multitasking, grouping, chunking, sticking stuff together, but you still have to do a lot of the same things. You have to have the same basic knowledge, except you don't have to go through a board of directors to be able to make a final decision at the end of the day. Bingo. Yeah, uh, and that's where real freedom come, yeah. comes comes into comes into place. But those companies, a lot of companies, know today that people do ask the question, and nobody prior to to myself um, actually asked to do what I do. Nobody went and knocked on the doors, and because, and part, honestly, part of it, I don't know why the doors were opened. Um, one of the first doors that was opened was into Jackie Dro, uh, Blancpa, and Breguet. Mm -hmm. And that was because I met Mark Hayek, um, and he said, sure. And other companies that I went to looked at me like I was a raving lunatic. Um, and it was just like there was no way an outsider, especially a foreigner, was going to come in uh -huh, have access to the product. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, which, I mean, in a sense, I mean, it's a very yeah. close community. It was a very close community, so that makes sense. But now, more and more companies, they have, they, they, they literally, I want to say give me the keys to the shop, but that was what happened with Breguet. Um, I made a, a list of about a dozen pieces that I wanted to, to touch, I wanted to go into. And I started with the most simple, and I went to one of the most, some of the most complicated, and then at the very end of it, and this was a personal thing, um, because it has no commercial value to them to share a new product makes sense to a company because if it is intrinsically uh, qualitative, uh, if it's intrinsically quality and it's something which is a, a genuine product, they want to share that. Uh, but that's a modern product, a modern watch. Mm -hmm. What they let me do at the end, and I have to say, I, I, it took me a long time before the final okay was given, but they went to their collection and they gave me an original 
Breguet Torbion uh, pocket watch with uh, Chapon Naturel, with Fusey, made during the life of Mr. Abraham Louis himself. Mm. And I did that and I did the same thing. And there were people all around me looking at me like, how did he do that? And they actually, I even got some of the watchmakers to sit down on my bench so they could get in there and have a closer look. But the reverence, almost the fear they had of what was in front of them was extraordinary. But more and more companies today realize that what I do, and probably what other people like me will do in the future, because the door is now partially open, mm -hmm. is necessary. Um, and I think it will become more and more necessary in the in the future as well. So, so, the, so just so people understand, um, what Peter does, and you, if you haven't clicked already on it on his website, is he has something called deconstruct, and he doesn't just take apart. Um, you know, basic movements. Peter takes apart masterpieces, and he's and he's kind of authorized and the first person to think of this. Instead of the past, where me and Peter, we we both done many many years of after sales service. Instead of us being the only ones that got to see the inside of these masterpieces, he's showing you the world these masterpieces, and it's almost baffling. Like no one has thought about doing this before and documenting so clearly in in the way that you do this because it's a message for eternity. It's stamped in time forevermore. But the ability for Peter to, once again, he's a groundbreaker. He broke down walls, walk right into like Breguet and said, I want to take apart your crap. And they said, yes. And he probably no, went home that night going, wait, <laughs> did they really say yes? Yeah. <laughs> Do I go back tomorrow? Is that guy fired? Hey, you know, right? please. <laughs> I'll have another earth break. We've got to talk to you someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like probably when, you know, when, when Anthrax got our first big record deal and stuff, because back then they just told us our music sound like, you know, when you flush the toilet, like go home, little boy, come back, paint eyebrows, you know, puff your hair up and, and come back, you know, we'll have a producer make your music for you. You know, and they didn't get it. But when we finally inked it, we went home and we're like, are we really getting that check? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the same thing. But Peter is, is a groundbreaker and, you know, for him to get this where it is, you need you need to tune in, uh, and it, especially fascinating for collectors. But also, I think you are right, Peter, what they're realizing, the, the larger companies that you're dealing with as well, uh, besides the independence, because Peter also, we'll, we'll get to that, he, he also deconstructs independence, um, is they're realizing there's a new way. You know, it's taken a very long time for the Swiss to wake up a little bit that there is a new way, um, you know, and, and they really put a lot of um, cloud in you. I don't know if they should have, but they, but they did. <laughs> so we commend you, Peter, for leading the pack and hopefully many others kind of follow and, and, and build on the foundation that you're building right now because you're building a really solid foundation. And swiftly, it's quite, quite, it's incredible. You know, we get to see inside of masterpieces that normally as watchmakers, we're never going to see. And, uh, we want to thank yeah, you. Yeah, re recently I, was, I noticed that you had the McGonagall, the Keol, and uh, another uh, amazing Irish uh, creation to the uh, the Legacy Machine Perpetual Calendar by Stephen McDonald, which is uh, by, for for MBNF. It's just to to be able to take apart five hundred on minute pieces and. To have an, an understanding, because I know myself, and I would like, we, I hope to speak to Stephen McDonald in the in the near future on in the metal dam, and uh, so I know that even creating that piece, that uh, extraordinary perpetual calendar for MBNF, reinventing what the perpetual calendar, the fundamentals of that, the whole philosophy of it, and going back to the drawing board and. Uh, Starting off from the, you know, from the, the the full days of the month, but I I know how he did, but I understand that he ha it wasn't straightforward for Stephen either, and you know it, it took a eureka moment to make that all come together, and uh, so to see you, as I say, what as Dan said, what the naked watchmaker is, the naked watchmaker takes these extraordinary watches, and shot by shot, Peter deconstructs each watch 
unless it bare, you, you literally you're laying it naked in its bare components, and uh, so it gives you an insight into the complexity and the, how challenging it has been to create these watches in the first place. Um, it, there was one question I wanted to ask you. That I felt that we perhaps because I want to go back to the naked watchmaker in a moment, but I also wanted to know based on what you said at the start, Peter, about your so there was no obvious lineage of watchmaking or anything in your family, uh, in your DNA. At what point did you realize, or what was it that made you realize that not only can I do this, but I am a prodigious talent? Because I'm sure, like, I know you'd be a very probably modest kind of guy, say, oh, I'm not, but you were. And you're due to succeed and to establish a reputation like you have in among connoisseurs and aficionados around the world as a master outdoor luxury independent watchmaker. When did you realize that you had this extraordinary talent? Was it that most step or was it later? <laughs> um, <You're welcome. laughs> oh God, you're such a lovely man. Uh, you really are, Johnny. Um, <laughs> it's probably the um, one he was drinking beers on the weekend that was that. <laughs> 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 oh um, man listen I I'm, I'm, uh, I heard this quote recently that um, something along the lines of uh, talent isn't necessarily something which is given it's something which is earned uh, or it's developed, it's built and my early life was all about learning never stopping learning i used as a kid when i was 10 years old actually nine years old i i used to go from where i was living in epping essex which was the end of the central line which was one of the subway uh, tube uh, tube lines yeah and with a friend of mine simon every weekend we would go into central london and we would every saturday we would go to another museum we loved going to these museums wow and then when i was and when I think I've got, a, I've got a ten-year-old daughter, not a chance in hell would I let her do that. Um, yeah, it being even at the same period, there's no way. I don't, but there was me and my mate. We would do that, and we were like not even ten years old. And I know I remember from the age of thirteen, I would be doing it on my own. I'd, I love to do that. And everything that I have done has always been about learning. Uh, I went from. I went from Hackney to Wostep, and then I worked for a company called Watches of Switzerland in Oxford, which covered everything okay. from Tisco products. And then I was the Piaget watchmaker in London, where I did mostly Piaget, but also uh, Vacheron. Um, then I did a stint with Rolex and, uh, and, and Omega. And basically, I absorbed everything that I could. And the moment that I had kind of mastered it, I got bored. And I moved on. Mm -hmm. And the, the longest period that I ever spent in one being an employee was at Somno Antiques in London because the learning curve was so incredibly steep. It was for, in fact, in antique uh, restoration, it never ends. It's incredible. It's the most fascinating world to be in when you're kind of privileged to have all these pieces coming in from all over the world, from all of the different auction houses from all the collectors because there are not enough watchmakers who know how to do that kind of work yeah. um, so taking everything that i did then going to to, to reno and pappy and then becoming independent it was it was all one journey uh, when i started um as selling my own watches with my own design um the people who were around were people like philip defour Vianney halter um there weren't actually there was a bunch of guys in the ahci but it was it was tiny um and i just did the best that i could do with nothing meaning that i didn't have money uh, i had a small uh, collection of tools which i developed over many years antique stuff which i ended up selling to finance what i did and as i made my watches from the very beginning collectors bought them and 
it was it was kind of an affirmation that what I did had value. I didn't turn around and think like uh, you know I'm I'm shit hard at what I do. Uh, I felt privileged, grateful to have the opportunity to do what I was doing, and to see that there were these collectors, often from California, but I mean, actually, it started off in Japan, then it was often in California. These guys who kind of sponsored myself, oh. also the other makers of around me, and then these guys actually helped nurture the industry. And these guys are kind of like the unsung heroes. We don't actually, very rarely does, every, does anybody give them any kind of credence. But these are the guys who actually nurtured. They were the early adopters of watchmaking. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, what I do today is a continuation of what I've always done is, is to learn. Um, and as I did in London and as I do today, I like to give, I like to share. Um, the, there was never a, a sense, I don't have the kind of ego that says I'm a, a, I'm a badass. Um, because we all are and we all not. It all depends on uh, how you perceive yourself. It is what you believe at the end of the day. You know, you once said something that said uh, that was my work is a representation of who I am. Um, yeah. And that holds, Many that holds true for you and your story is certainly representative of you, but it's also representative of, um, of other independents. And I, I do want to get that shout out to the collectors um, who are really true collectors who really love most of them that, that, that I think I'm talking about. And I think Peter is talking about um, it goes way beyond collecting a timepiece. They really are um, collecting art. And they really are funding the beginning stages of our art. And you are like sponsors. I've said really this previously. Are. I said this previously when 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 we when we interviewed other people, because um, we hear the same story, Peter. You know, I, I really didn't have much money. I needed, you know, I didn't even have a Shaolin seventy. You know, and that first person who believed in me enabled me to get my Shaolin and get going. Then the next person believed in me. And I can't, if you think back, I can't even believe they gave me that money at that time. But really it's like these collectors, they, they wish they could stop their life and place themselves in woe step and be watchmaker. They're beyond normal, just collectors. They really want to be in it. Um, Cross reference again, because we do have music people following this is would be, they want to be in the band. You know, like what thrash metal, what we did to music, uh, meaning the big four bands was, we didn't say, I'm a rock star. Uh, you can't get on my stage. Uh, look Ooh. out, I gotta puff my hair. It was, you know, mosh it up, come on up, jump off this thing, you're in the band. Like if you get something from me, it is me. If you catch my pick, that means that name on yeah. there, whatever I yeah. put on there, if it was a Simpsons dude or whatever it was, it's like, because I directed the pick company because I wanted that on there and I had someone draw it and it's me. You're getting a piece of me and my art. And that's what uh, independent watchmaking is. You really are buying into who we are. But the problem that Peter had way back when is we didn't have our own TV station. You guys all have YouTube now. You have your own TV station. If you haven't figured that out now, you really need to realize you have your own TV station to market yourself. Do you know how valuable that is? When me and Peter were starting, it, be it watchmaking or music, yeah. $5,000 to take out a little ad somewhere. You don't have money for that. You have freedom. Yeah. You have Instagram where you can post your pictures all day long. You can really get your art out there. You should really take advantage of that. Don't, don't just shush it under the rug kind of thing. Really utilize that self if you're a young watchmaker starting out to, to transmit your art of who you are. Um, you know, you're hearing these stories from all these people and they're starting to sound somewhat similar. Uh, we don't, most of us like Peter, we don't want the accolades. We don't want to be told this, that we we're amazing for this. We don't really care. You know why? We all have extreme OCD. All of us. It's off the, let's see, look at Peter. He knows it. We're all off the chart. He said it. He said, I get bored. I can't stay there long. That's all of yeah. us. Well, all of us that are where we are, let's say, there's people that are very comfortable. They can go to watchmaking school, come out, and they're looking for a very steady job and a steady paycheck. That's wonderful. That fits their skin. But but for people like Peter, he's that's not okay with him. He was there to suck knowledge anywhere he could get it, but he didn't even know where he was going back then. 
He just probably doesn't even know where he's going. To. I don't even know today. <laughs> <laughs> None of us do. It's that OCD. Like extra, it's extra, OCD. Extra. Look, you know, all musicians that are very accomplished, Peter, all of us, everyone that I've met at the top, 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 we're, we're, the OCD is off the chart. Most people don't know if they're sleeping, they're like rolling around in their sleep. You know, it's just, we're all the same. Um, and it really does transcend because we're true artists. Um, your brain's not supposed to really rest. It's supposed to be creating at all times and you're never happy with yourself. And even the things you do are great, but they're really not great. You got to keep pushing forward. What can I do next? Who, you know, what can I do? And, and we're on, it's like a rat cage. We're really never going to get anywhere, but we are getting somewhere because the legacy that you're leaving, Peter, especially with what you're doing now is, is it's going to impact many for, for many, many, many generations. It's information. And it's not going to go away any, again anymore, and it's not hidden anymore. And I, that's why I find really, really amazing about what you're doing with the Naked Watchmaker. It's um, it's it's never historical been. record. Okay. Yeah. What I do want to say is, and this is really important, is that some people think that the Naked Watchmaker is really for for watchmakers, or it's about teaching watchmaking, and that is not the case. Uh -huh. To become a watchmaker, it takes years. You can't go into a school and come out as a master watchmaker after two weeks or a weekend. So the goal of the site is to be able to, to share knowledge, is to be able to educate. It is not there to teach people to become physically a watchmaker. It's there to be able to help people to understand about watchmaking, which is why on the site you've got the you have the, the biggest section, or the, the first section was always the deconstructions. That's really the most labor intensive, and that's the biggest part of it. But then there's a section called making, which is a development. It constant, it's all in constant development. But the deconstruction, the deconstructions explain how the watches work. The making explains how the watches are made. And then you have a glossary, which actually is again, constantly in the process of being developed, which actually ex helps you to understand what the terms are, what the different kinds of watches are, what is a sonnery, minute repeater, quarter minute quarter repeater, five minute repeater, half quarter, quarter repeater. Everything that is explained or shared on the site is there. So that's three legs. But the fourth leg, and this actually, Dan, is something that you're going to participate in, even though you don't know it yet, okay? <laughs> we, have, we have a section called people where you have 12 questions and everybody has posed the same 12 questions, but those people are all players who are in the industry. They're people who bring something. They can be, it can, it can be a collector. We've had collectors. It can be a journalist, a blogger. Um, it can be a CEO of a company. It can be a CFO. It can be a watchmaker, a designer, a technician. It can be anybody who actually plays a part because everything else, all the other three legs, don't exist if you don't have the person. Uh -huh. Everything is born inside the brain of an individual. And yeah. with those four legs, you have a solid table. It's all there. And that is something that I didn't even know when I began that it was going to be as kind of coherent. Um, and people don't obviously see it when they go to the site, but they will. And it will become stronger and stronger as, as time goes by. Um, I, I saw. I, I did notice that in uh, uh, very swiftly uh, because that's that's what I like to read about. I like to read, as you can see, that's the premise of this show that me and Johnny have. Is I like the behind the scenes, the behind the scenes, because you know not many people can get out from that person what they really and truly are, and that really is what. Uh, well, for an independent watchmaker, let's say trying to get his art out there, that's really what the collector wants. You know, he wants that story, uh, the struggle. Uh, like you're hearing Peter's struggle, where you know what he's gone through in his life to get where he is today at the plateau and this um, in this new endeavor. Well, well, not so new, but new. Um, that's what people like to read about. Um, that that's human human nature. It's human interest. They can relate to that. Yeah. They can, yeah. And a lot of our heroes, Peter, they're they're dead and gone. You know, the brigades mm -hmm. are gone. We we can't talk with them. All we could do is, like you did, you know, take a had the privilege to take apart something like that's like in music somebody like van halen you know given you know he had you know, hendrix take apart my guitar you know yeah. he's, he's gone he can't speak but that guitar spoke and 
You know, mm -hmm. like Dweezil Zappa has a, has a piece of the, 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 the guitar that was on fire that he threw into the audience at one show. And his dad, uh, Frank, you know, rebuilt that guitar. Now Dweezil has it. You know, that, that tells a story eternally. You know, just being near it in the room probably would make me shake. I wouldn't even want to touch it. But you wow. went in and, and you touched some Breguet stuff. So I don't know if you washed your hands or not since then. But I'd still be shaking too, bro. <laughs> but yeah. I, I get, I, I get. It. It's wonderful what you're doing, Peter. We all need more of you in this world. Um, you know, giving back, uh, more, more of just giving back information to these watchmakers who can actually get it now. You know, me and you struggled, bro. We had to go across those Swiss borders and Swiss winters and those Swiss buses and live in strange places to gain the knowledge. Um, yeah, we we can't all just learn on the internet how to take apart a watch and be a watchmaker. Uh, I find that very dangerous myself where people are using that term so loosely. Um, I, I saw you shake your head a little bit. I, I think we're all in the same kind of frame of mind with that one. Um, you can't, it's impossible. Um, the knowledge that Peter has gained throughout, it, it can only be gained to go into school, sitting at a bench and also coming, coming, coming across uh, and meeting people in the industry to see really how it's <laughs> run to, to birth his own brand. Uh, to find that money, look look at the story he's telling you. He did it. He had no money. He was already making his first watch. That's determination. Those are the people that succeed no matter what happens, no matter what crumbles, no matter how blessed they are. They seem to just keep plowing through and plowing through. You know, their OCD just keeps pushing them and pushing them. It's their personality. It's what God has placed inside them. Mm -hmm. um, and and Peter is really doing that now. It's uh, it's incredible, man. You're an incredible dude, bro. <laughs> You just gotta stop, yeah, stop drinking those beers on the weekend. <laughs> but I, I want to marry you. You're a wonderful person. <laughs> Listen, let's let's talk for a second about watchmaking schools. We touched on Wolf. Um, we have uh, the the KHWCC school with Henri, which I always. Uh, as well, you know, my alma mater is Woe Step in Neuchatel, but I, that for today's uh, people, I will highly recommend this school because as far as I know, it's the only school that really also gives the students an opportunity to uh, make bridges, build their own watch in the end, obviously not the main plate, but bridges and create whatever they, it was like a Simone thing. Here's, you know, here's a 6498, do what you'd like to do to it, which is that person's art. And I feel that that should be certainly be part of the schooling in, in all schools. Um, so we, we, we see the impact that Wostep has had on Peter and, and how Anton Simone has actually impacted all of us. Because you're going to see that you're starting to see the thread of some of the people that have come on the show. And you're going to see how they all intertwine it. And they all have come from those doors at Wostep in Neuchatel. And it's quite fascinating the impact on the independent watch industry and the mainstream watch industry, what that school, that little teeny school who only takes 10 people has, mm -hmm. has on our industry. It's it, for me, it's mind blowing. Yeah. I was going to say that um, I'm actually seeing Henrik on uh, uh, Saturday because we have uh, a project together because with what I do today, it's all phot photographic, which it has to be because I can't film and do the job, so to speak. And from from this weekend, we start a new project, whereby of different types of pieces. And the first one is just a, a high quality, simple, uh, automatic timepiece. You'll see what it is later. Um, but basically, I direct, explain, film, and then Henrik will actually go through and stage by stage, he will actually just take the piece apart, and then everything will be explained how it's done in a video fashion, um, why it's done that way, with all of the necessary specialized tooling, everything which is involved. So it goes on to another level, but it will only be uh, by types of watches, meaning like a simple timepiece, the Torbjörn, a Quantum Perpetual, Minute Repeater, Grand Sonnery, opposed to examples of each of those by different companies, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, what, one of the, the basic differences with um, with Henrik and his school is that he only takes on about half a dozen students. So it's much more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, experience with him. And from what I understand, and if you go to the Naked Watchmaker and you click on the school section and you go to the, the school there, you have uh, six testimonials 
by six very different young people, ranging from like 24 to 39 years old. I think there's an Australian guy who's about 39. And basically, they have they follow a course which it has this is already quite has a solid foundation which is set mm -hmm. but depending on their preferences on what they want to do where they want to go the, the uh henrik will actually let them do different things or he will actually lead them so if somebody's more interested in making the bridge the main plate or wheel he will then lead them into that technical aspect of manufacturing of individual components if somebody else has another pre preference whether it's after self service or finishing high quality finishing um, outside of the basic uh, the basic core structure he will actually help them learn what they want to do and in a school like Wostep I don't think they have that as much flexibility because they have more people as well and it's not a criticism it's just a different animal at the end of the day well I think I think um, well Enrique went to Wostep about the time I did uh, so same same structure as when you went so mm -hmm. me and you and him went at a time uh, in that school that uh, Antoine did similar he said with me, I, I kind of went, you know, breezed through and then I was in the complication room. Yeah. He let, 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 let me go, if you know what I mean. And it was the same thing when I uh, did the, the four-year bull of a school here in America. I, I, I kind of just ripped through that. Um, and that's the way it should be because we all are human and we all are finding a different pathway. Someone might actually want to just be a polisher. You know, that's what they really want to be, just the best, you know, case restoring person on, on the planet. So he, he also, Enrique, I, in that school, embraces CNC, which is a big part of what I'm trying to transmit in independent watchmaking to the collectors that watch, um, that, that are interested in, in our timepieces, because uh, CNC got a bad rap. You know, they think, uh, you know, it's, we, we buy this big machine and the parts come just spitting out into our hand and we just like assemble them like, you know, like a little kid gets a like a, a bubble gum out of the bubble gum machine kind of thing at the supermarket. So I'm trying to uh, educate everyone along those lines that the CNC machines that we use are prototype CNC machines. It's usually one part of the time, or in my case, I built my own from scratch uh, by looking at people and staring at pictures like from Mark Jenny or Hajime Osaka, who, who way back then were the innovators of that because back then we couldn't afford, they couldn't afford CNC machines and built their own. Um, and so I'm trying to educate people that and anyway, um, Enrique is very uh, um, embracing CNC. I know this is a CNC machine in the school. It's very lengthy to learn it, but at least he's has it in there and he's showing and he's showing, I see he's showing, cause look, the bottom line is we're all staring at you and your school, Enrique, the pictures and your blog are amazing. We're all looking at your tools and our mouths are like, Ugh, please, you know, can, can I just come there for a weekend? We're all like that. But in addition to that, he's, he's spreading, um, and teaching how they uh, need to utilize social media, how they need to take clear pictures when they leave the school and sell themselves, sell their art in, in modern times. It's not just learn the ancient way to take apart a Rolex and you're on your way now, bro. You know, it's-, yeah, it's there's, there's so many different facets to it wonderful nowadays, school. really. Wonderful yeah. school and he's doing it right. You know, he, he was an instructor from, from our time at Wostep, you know. Mm. Great dude. So, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, sorry, Peter, but there's so many different facets to the watchmaking industry now that one, an individual can pretty much be self-contained if you have the discipline, if you have the time to do your social media as well, your photography, uh, to, to, to be able to promote yourself. Uh, traditionally, things that would never have been the job of the watchmaker, they're, they're now... The, the watchmaker's responsibility is now a lot broader, and the independent anyway. And uh, so, and as you're doing too with with the naked watchmaker, is you know it's a constant process of promoting and sharing and growing that audience and growing that awareness of uh, of, of what you're doing to show what's behind the, the the scene, what's behind the dial of these of these watches, and uh, so it's it's. Incredible, but when we said earlier on that we were going to aim for about the one hour mark, and I just wanted to run uh, one or two questions past you uh, that some of the people who have been watching, and thank you very much, everyone, for dropping in your comments and uh, giving us a little bit of support and all that tonight, and uh, for 
uh, my great friend Barbara Palumbo, who wants to know if we can start a drinking game every time we drop uh, the name of a band in. Maybe we can do that in future episodes. We're a little bit late for tonight, Barbara. Uh, but one by Tom McCullough, who has been regularly watching us from the start. And uh, I don't know if you can put it to yourself, Peter, or to both of you guys. But what is the best watch you've ever worked on and why? I get the sense, Peter, we're probably talking about the Breadway, the original Turbion. And, uh, but I can't answer that question for you. What, what, what's your... Should I go first, then? Y yes, please. Okay. Um, it's, it's a question that can't, in one way, can't be answered because there are so many incredible, not only watches, but incredible people who make them. Yeah. And quite often the watch... One of the questions I've been often asked is, what would you buy? And it's often for me, it's not about the watch. It's actually about the person behind it. Because I know the lives of most of those guys, whether it's a Sapa Neva, whether it's um, a Gronefeld, whether it's a McGonagall. I know yeah. what you guys have done. So I can't have a an objective view to buying a product, which is a watch, because of the individuals. And it's the individuals that... Uh, that have a, you know, it's, it's an emotional purchase at the end of the day and it'll be influenced by them. But the story, abbreviated story of one of the most amazing things that I've ever had the fortune to touch was linked with the owner. And it was a, a watch which was made or commissioned, one of a series of watches commissioned by JP Morgan after the, the crisis in, in America, whenever, 1920s or whenever that was. And he commissioned for each one of his directors a god i can't even remember it was um i think it was a frogem um made by a watchmaker called Nic nickel nielsen and it was a minute repeater torbian split second pocket watch it was a it was a clock of a watch i mean it was a huge thing and in america during the 1980s there was uh there were floods in california and one of these watches was in a safe. It was owned by a woman called, uh, she's, she will have passed well, by yeah. now. So yeah, her name yeah. is Nancy Burkett. And Nancy Burkett was the daughter of one of those original directors. And they searched everywhere to actually have that watch repaired. And they couldn't find anybody at that time. We're talking a long time ago now, over 25 years ago. Um, and they couldn't find anybody in America to do it. So they asked Christie's, they asked Sotheby's, and the all of the arrows pointed to to us in in london and i had the men in black come and interview me before they even delivered the watch because they wanted to interrogate me to make sure that i was actually real and this i didn't even know what was going to arrive and then one day yeah. in like a shoebox this watch arrives and this watch was the most profoundly beautiful thing i think i've ever seen it was massive it was perfection. Nicole Nielsen was an, an amazing manufacturer of calibers. They were like, uh, it's like a white label thing that Frogen would have taken, but to his style and it would be made by Nielsen. The case was made by a company called Toms, Fred, Fred, Frederick Toms, which was just invisible hinges and um, you could just feel it. It just oozed craftsmanship, beauty and weight and material and polishing and, and history. And the dial was made by Oh, God. Um, Willis. And Willis was one of the most famous dial makers of that period, I'm going back to the end of the 19th century. And I remember having it. And there was a certain amount of damage. And we had a workshop with three other guys. And I got each guy in the workshop to make a component to replace the one sympathetically so that you couldn't see what was wrong with it. And most of the guys, there, they, they all loved what they did, but they thought I was mad. Because he says, like, we normally don't do that. You know, everybody does their own restoration. But I wanted each one of those guys to be part of that. Okay. Everything was finished. It was amazing. It became part of me, in a sense. Um, and it was, it was Nancy even offered to set me up in California. We would have these long telephone calls. And she said, come over, come over to California, come over to Los Angeles, and, uh, and I'll set you up in your own workshop over here. And not for a second did I actually imagine that I would do 
Yeah. Because I was so committed to what I was doing at that time. But it was, I think I was like 20 years old or 20. No, I was 22 years old. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 30 years ago. But that will kind of live with me forever. So that was kind of like yes. the grail watch. That's, that answers, actually nearly answers a question I asked earlier about the, at, at what point did you realize that at age 22, handling a, a historic masterpiece like that, uh, it kind of it answers two questions. What about yourself, well, Dan? Got, well, it just goes to show you what, what you've been saying and the whole time, Peter, is um, whoever is interested in our art as micro mechanics or as independent watchmakers is really buying our lifelong journey and story. Um, because that's what we buy into. You see what Peter just told you, the story, why, why was he interested in that timepiece? It had an incredible story of who made this, who made the dial, who did this, yeah. who did that, the pain and suffering of that person. Um, totally. For me, it doesn't really even have to be complicated. You know, my, my whole goal, my whole OCD, when I started to do, want to get my papers was, I want to get to do, take apart the most complicated stuff in the whole world, the stuff that no one else can do. And yeah, I mean, I got there, but it really, what I learned along that way is solidity, longevity. I saw watches that were basic and overbuilt 10 times better than the thicker and better than they should have ever been built. Um, yeah. Because they usually built by somebody. I remember even taking apart a corporate watch um, uh, Phillips flew me in to take apart. There's only like, like one or two of the the Rolex Zero Graphs, which is before all Daytonas. It's the actual first single button when they were just trying to figure out how a chronograph even works, and the button wouldn't yeah. work and stuff. And they don't even want anybody inside it because like one person had ever been inside it was up for auction. I think it was sold as the second most expensive Rolex ever. Something like that going inside that. That was very enjoyable for me, even though for me at that time, it wasn't very complicated, but man, the story behind that timepiece, who touched it, who wore it, how to get there, why is it worth these millions and millions of dollars? You know, it's the story. And that's what this show is about in the metal. It's about, yeah, it's about the story. You know, Peter has an incredible story. He's leaving a legacy for all of the future of watchmaking. And it's not just going to be in his name. Um, it's going to be, his he's giving his giving back spirit which it seems has been throughout his entire existence if he knew it or not he was he wanted to show other watchmakers what he was taking apart it goes way back and i i'm finding this in all the people that we're starting to interview here yeah, I mean, oh, in the yeah, yeah you have these loving peter has a loving heart and the problem with people with loving heart is usually we get stepped on we get stomped on we get taken advantage of and I'm not going to go into that, but most of all the people that I'll be talking to have some of that in their history. But you know what? They, they, they can't persevere. It doesn't make them cold. I don't think these people will ever really be cold. They'll just be a little wiser around the corner um, with people with suits and ties and that kind of thing. I learned that early on in music, you know, cigars, suits and ties. And all. But anyway, <laughs> um, Peter is a wonderful person. <laughs> he's he's, he's yeah, you learn fast, dude. We're not victims. We're, we, <laughs> we're very fortunate to do what we do, okay? And I, I think so, yeah. Daily yeah. job. We just choose to do it another way, which yeah. is yeah. what a luxury. And we also want to press that point that I keep pressing is um, the collectors, please, if you really do have that expendable money and you really in, are interested in some somebody's story who is an independent, buy their timepiece, it, buy their dream before it's a timepiece. Give them their funds. Ask them if they need something else. Do they need machines? Can you afford to do that? You're helping not just that person, but perhaps that person is someone like Peter who can help someone else and another watchmaker with 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 that great fortune. He won't take take that money and squander it like somebody else would. He would actually utilize that to help other human beings and other watchmakers and watchmaking in general. Um, get to the, its newest and next level, which um, independent watchmaking is of today. What Peter is doing today uh, with the Naked Watchmaker is it's uncharted territory. He's basically like thrash metal. It's what he is. He's like when, <laughs> he is, he's in. He's the first thrash metal band. You know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> way back when we had BNA, we had B and A Holta. We had uh, um, uh, Peter uh, Paul Gerber for me. You know, those were the thrash metal dudes for me when I was wanting to 
do what I want to do today, which, you know, create my own movement and all that, which I couldn't do back then. I didn't, I didn't it wasn't feasible. You know, those are my little thrash metal heroes, but we're now at the next plateau. Where are we going to go from here? You know, we have it exploding in Japan, independent watchmaking. We have Peter representing, Germany. you know, his country and British watchmaking. Um, look, not only that, look, you have even uh, uh, Roger W. Smith. Look, he's giving back. He's expanding, but he is taking people from watchmaking schools. He's giving lectures. He's coming to the, the British uh, watchmaking uh, associations and schools to, 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 to speak. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do that. You don't have to do what you're doing. It, it is a giving culture in the independent sector, I think, you know? We all, we uh, all, have, to, we all have to give back. I mean, that's, that's just the love of all, love Because you all know what it's like. You all know how difficult it is. You all recognize each other's challenges and the, the, the obstacles that are put in front of you and that some of you make it and some of you don't. And it's, you know, th there's that sort of community spirit. And particularly, Peter, as I say, I am gonna, I'm going to do the unpopular thing here now and start drawing this to an end. We're at 75. And um, I, I just want to say that what you've done for uh, the, the watch industry, for the independence, to showcase what you've done with the Nick Watchmaker. What your new project with Henry Corpella sounds like it's uh, another fascinating insight. I don't know whether that's geared more for the young watchmakers or for the same uh, wider public that, that the naked watchmakers for. But um, one thing's for sure, I would love to find out more about it. And I would hope that if we were to give you a call someday, Peter, and say, what are you doing this evening? <laughs> that uh, maybe you could uh, come back and join us again. I hope you've enjoyed this. Johnny, Danny, when are you guys next in uh, in the Geneva, Switzerland area? When are you coming over? We'll let you know, obviously, because of the times that we're in, everything is sideways a little bit. But yeah, uh, I mean, do you have any plans? I mean, like for next year, uh, semester? First as semester? soon as possible, you know, especially as soon yeah. as my, uh, I would say that the second my movement is completely fully uh, moving, I'll be about. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. I'll tell you something. I think, Dan, we've talked about this ourselves. I would like to take in the metal on the road and uh, get yeah. us a big fancy tour bus and uh, all the trimmings and uh, yeah yeah uh, i stepped off and that I, tour bus and i'm not going back bro that was 90 but 2008 hey, i tried it for a second time 2005 to 2008 for that reunion it was wonderful but i don't want to sleep on a tour bus bro well here I, I i i'll do that for a while i i missed that out when i was a kid so uh, you know i'll do uh no i would love to actually take uh in the metal on the road i'll come and visit yeah. you peter and go and talk to the guys that we're we're with and meet them. Yep. Travel around and uh, get a real a, a sense for the the sounds and smells, the, the, the people, their lifestyle, the thing, the environment that you're living in. And uh, so that's that is that is part of our plan in the future, uh, Peter, is to infiltrate further into your privacy at all costs. <laughs> we do have that plan too. And come to like the schools, like we've discussed today, and uh, you know, show people them in a in a different kind of light. That probably I'd be one of the few people that can kind of get that message across, because uh, I just don't yeah, give yeah. a crap. I don't have to give a crap, and that's just tell it like it is. It's the way I've always yeah, been, yeah. and I will be me, uh, telling the truth and cutting through all of the bull crap that's within a suit and a tie. Keep it going. <laughs> Listen, when I. Before I began the, the Naked Watchmaker, I had developed a, a tendency to be, I was disrespectful, but not particularly enamored by a lot of the big companies and the big groups. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a group, say so the companies, the brands, the because <clears throat> the, the umbrellas that are around them are not necessarily reflective of the actual companies. <clears throat> and the more time I spend in those companies, <clears throat> excuse me, the more I realize actually how common, not common people are, how similar people actually are. And how even if you have these large companies which have machines churning out a lot of different product, when you actually sit down and you talk to a lot of the people, maybe who don't have uh, quite the OCD that we do, um, they're actually really still driven. And you meet incredible people 
pretty much everywhere. <clears throat> and it's something which I hadn't really expected, but I've come across. And there's a lot of similar, there's like a language. And the la it's not French, it's not German, it's not English. There's like a horological language. It goes beyond everything. And it's when you are in it as a watchmaker or a constructor or a technician or even as a finisher, you all kind of, it kind of brings everybody together. So when you come over, okay, and you take it on the road, absolutely see the individuals, okay, see the, see the independence, but it doesn't end there because it goes a lot further and there's some incredible people. Uh, and just to finish on, and this may sound like something endlessly boring, okay, but I met the guy that runs uh, General Rezo, a guy called Alberto, okay, Alberto, is the guy who manages one of the three companies, I think, that makes mainsprings. And it's just like, how dull is a mainspring? And that you go through that factory, and then you see how they do it, depending on the quantities of pieces that they make and the kind of clients they have. And you see how far that even they are forced to push to be able to provide their mainsprings, their materials, to uh, a world which is changing. And the conviction that these guys have to be able to supply sometimes what are inane requests. Um, and you find in the most seemingly dull environment, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Yeah. So what you want to do, I mean, what you want to do, you do what you want to do. But I'd just say that be, be aware that it doesn't end that is extraordinarily broad a subject, which encapsulates so many different trades, art forms, skills, um, you will never come to a conclusion. And that is, I think, one of the absolutely bloody marvelous. And that's what makes it human. And that's why, as everything is important on The Naked Watchmaker, it comes back down to the same thing. It comes back to you, Johnny, and you, Danny. It's, it's the people who are behind it. and. I think that's part of why I love it. I like, generally speaking, I like people. I don't particularly like doing video chats, which is why I ask you when you kind of come over, because I'd much rather we'd be doing this with a beer. Yeah, yeah, uh, we will. We, absolutely, we will. And you know so what? I think, you, man. <laughs> absolutely, we will. I, I think, uh, Peter, don't you think back with Antoine Simone and Wostep those days where he would take us places and those little factories and stuff, and, and 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 now I think we realize why. Which what you just said. It's everyone counts. You are totally right. And um, those people are passionate. I remember going to a, a couple of dial factories that he took us to, and it was almost like, why are we going here? It would be cool, but why are we going to the second one? And I think those are the things he was trying to show us. Is yeah. that passion is the passion is everywhere. And it, it's incredible. Yeah, and small you, you're such a blessing to the world, Peter. You're a blessing to me, your blessing to us. So thank you so much for, for being on here and showing us all how it's done, showing us all how to pave new roads and keep pushing forward, how to channel uh, your OCD and how, how OCD is within all of us and to utilize kindness and love uh, to all you meet along the way, to um, put the past behind you, keep pressing forward and uh, show the world who you are and put that stamp on it, you know. Um, you're a blessing, bro. Greatly appreciate all your time. Indeed, Peter, thank you very, very much for, for joining us this evening. And uh, so folks, uh, we are gonna, as I say, thank Peter uh, for joining us tonight from the, from uh, near the, the Swiss border in France. And to, uh, just to thank everybody for watching us tonight for In The Metal. We're nearly going into this, uh, um, so we'd like to think that we'll see you again uh, next week and uh, when we will have some uh, another of the great personalities of the independent watchmaking uh, industry to give us a bit of an insight into their lives and to what rocks them and uh, to, uh, to have a look at what they're doing and also to keep a tab on what uh, our friend Dan is doing with his new movement. We, didn't get talking a lot about that this time around, but next time for sure we do another catch up. Peter, on behalf of myself, Johnny, you know I've been writing about you guys for a long time, and uh, so it's a real privilege to to have you on tonight. And uh, thank you so much, and to Daniela for uh, helping yes, facilitate all Daniela. this. Yeah, for sure. 
So thank you, Peter. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll catch you again. All the best, folks. We'll see you next time around on In the Metal. Bye.